Okay. I just want to do this. I want to put out an episode. I want to talk to you guys. It's been really busy here for me. I mean, I always say that it's busy for everybody. Um, it's been a kind of busy where I couldn't do this. Like, I feel like I'm looking way up. Oh, well, I'm not going to try to mess with the tripod because I'm rushing to get this done. Um, let me turn off the AC. And my dog's fixing to throw up. Please don't throw No, don't get on my lap. Not this time. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. Come on and get on my lap. Go ahead. Come on. This is Spot. He doesn't have an interesting name. Uh, he was given to us by a family that took some dogs from a shelter that was closing and one of them was pregnant and she had a bunch of puppies and Spot was the one that kept getting away and his name was Spot because of you know who Spot and uh my children were like oh that's a boring name though he doesn't have a special name so we renamed him Spoticus son of Bitsy anyway um so he's got an interesting name but we just call him Potsy all the time okay Hello everybody. It's been a while. I'm Michelle. This is my so-called handmade life. Uh, I have a blog by the same name and I'm Mamatronic on Ravelry and I'm uh, my so-called handmade life on Instagram. Louise was saying how she picked her um, YouTube name. It's also like her Instagram name or a variant of it, Poppy Pipkin years ago when she didn't imagine she would be talking to people back and forth and they might refer to her as Poppy Pipkin. <laughs> so Mamatronic is sort of the same thing. Um, I don't know, I was just being, I don't know, silly and I was sort of a mommy machine at the time, so. And now I'm sentimental about it and I won't change it. <clears throat> so anyway, I wonder how you've all been doing. Please leave me a comment telling me what's going on with you. Uh, what you're working on. Um, I feel like I haven't, I know I don't ever see you, but I feel like we talk via this uh, channel and I read the comments always um, and I'm answering them all. But uh, I've been, um, you know, we did the whole get our son into college thing and, and I did that lament and then we've had uh, just some busy, like getting, taking care of appointments and things. And then my video camera screwed up and it wouldn't, upload to my computer. It's an older Vixia, which is like a camcorder, but it's actually a really good choice for a cheap podcasting type camera. We didn't get it for that. We got it for filming soccer tournaments and games, and it was horrible for that because all you look through is a little flip out screen that's like this big and, you know, it's bright sunlight outside, so we couldn't even see what we were <laughs> You know, at one point my husband thinks he's catching the game and it's zoomed in and he's getting some feet and grass, you know. So it turned out to be only useful for this podcast, but because I was having problems with it, I couldn't upload anything. I have a uh, Canon 6D, but 60s, I didn't realize this when I got it. I also got it to film soccer games. Um, they don't have autofocus, so it's really, it's great if you can kind of override that somehow with Magic Lantern, but I don't feel confident doing that. And um, it, you can manual focus, which is great for video, but that's a different sort of video and not really easy to do when I'm sitting here. It's hard to, you know, have a stand in. Like I could set my dog here and focus, but nah. And I move around a lot like we all do when we're like saying, look at this and look at this, you know, so. I needed to get a new camera, and so I spent two weeks researching what should I do. And I thought of all these different ways to upgrade what I had, and I just decided that my 6D is great. It's great for in uh, rough weather and things, um, and taking on trips, but um, I wanted a, an easier video camera. I wanted something also that could do photo and video, the kind of photos I like. So anyway, I upgraded that, and uh, uh, it's so... Hopefully, that's all of that. And let me say, I got a big dose of YouTube while I was looking up, um, I was looking for websites, anything about uh, 
um, this camera versus that one or this lens versus that one and I was led to so many YouTube videos that um, just I was way um, saturated with YouTube personalities <laughs> and I, by the end of the two weeks I thought do I even want a YouTube channel I don't want to be like YouTube personality, um, I just felt kind of yick and, you know, drugged down by it. You know, everybody's all, hey, what's up? Doing all this into the camera. And, um, gosh, all the cuts. What is the deal with people cutting? Like, every word is a cut, 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 and cut, the cut, cat cut, you know. I don't understand. Um, unless, I don't know. I just don't understand why. Unless cutting things is now... Um, it's just trendy to cut it to cut it. I don't know. Jump cuts. That's what it is. And it was, I thought, I found it maddening. So anyway, um, I, I'll say that that was all like, that wasn't knitting podcasts, you know, I, I haven't like, um, become overstimulated by knitting podcasts. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of would be hard to do, to overstimulate someone with your knitting podcast. Um, that sounds, that sounds like fun, actually. <laughs> An overstimulating knitting podcast. Well, maybe I have one, you know, maybe this will be overstimulating today because I feel like I'm talking loud. I don't know how well this camera will take it, the mic. Um, I have been running all day. This week was the week of animals vet appointments and I just finished bringing my dog and my sister's dog. My sister's um, having some vision impairment and so we go to a lot of places together and her dog is the sweetest little chihuahua. It's like the only sweet <laughs> chihuahua I've ever met. You know how they're kind of protective of their owner. She's super laid back and um, it was an experience. It wasn't bad, really. Um, yesterday was terrible. I thought I was going to die. Um, Ella, the big dog, was trying to leap over the seat onto me and the, uh, one of my cats that was in a cage. It's been mad. It's been crazy. So, um, anyway, <laughs> that's why you haven't seen me for a while. I've been watching too many YouTube videos about, um, you know, cheap cameras versus this versus that, and I've been taking care of all my pets. I also have been working hard on my test net. I have the bot the back of this. It's about, this is the front of my sea glass and driftwood. That's Annie Lupton's, um, one of her patterns that'll be coming out in October, uh, you can see how beautiful it is. Whoop. Here we go. This is just great color work. I feel so proud of my color work here. I've never done something that looks so perfect without being blocked. It's so smooth. Now I'm going to block it out some for size and you can see it's curling because this would not fit me obviously. This looks like a, I don't know, a sleeve. <laughs> but when I block it out it will be I'll have a few inches of these. Um, I might have, should have knit the next pattern up, but I signed up for a small, so I'm going to go ahead and knit a small. And like I said, I might block it out a bit and see if I can get closer to a medium size after I knit it. But um, it's just so much fun to work on. I'm not bored at all with the repeats. Um, you know, it's not a lot, like it's a, it's a big chart, but you take it in chunks and you do just a few. Uh, rows several times and then a few more and then a few more uh, so it's easy to memorize these repeats and I'm really loving the way this Knit Picks Hawthorne um, it's a discontinued color it's one of their tonal um, hand paints and it was called Knob Hill it's kind of a pinky purple I mean a purple a purple kind of lilac colored um, there's no pink in it um, tonal. Let me pull out uh, a little bit of the yarn. You can see here. Maybe. Boop. There we go. Oh, look, this is focusing pretty well. Oh, 
I'm so sick of thinking about cameras. <laughs> and you're going to get camera overload too in this episode because I cleaned out my camera closet. <laughs> I'm going to show you some of the goodies I have in it. So the back is what I'm working on now. And I'm probably this far along the back. So really, I just need a good day to knock out that back piece. Join them um, and then it sleeves. I'm going to do my sleeves two at a time and they're going to be um, a solid. The um, Let's see. Oh no, they're going to be this color, the purple. This light color is uh, Stroll Tonal. Um, by Knit Picks also, and it's like pearlescent, and that's still for sale with them. They have comparable things to this. I think the new um, Stroll Tonals and Hawthorne Kettle Dyed uh, colors would be comparable. This was a hand paint, so it was supposed to be variegated, but I found that it wasn't too wildly variegated. That's why I liked it, and I got three skeins, and it should be enough for a size small, which was also a good reason to knit the small because I don't think I would have had enough yarn for a medium in these colors. Anyway, that is something I've, it's taken all my focus um, when I work on it. I, I can have something going on the TV or listen to something, but I can't read. I have to be looking down because I'm using two hands at once, right? So I'm doing sort of a continental with one hand and a English with the other. And uh, it's going really well though. I'm really enjoying it. And she is having a sale right now. It's going to probably be over by the time I get this out. But she's doing um, one pattern each day this week. Is uh, there's a I don't know what the, the percentage off is. But she did that earlier with some of her summer weight uh, patterns. And I got like three of them. And I already had one or two. So uh, she's, this is all about texture this week. So she's got some really great textured... Uh, patterns. I think I showed you some in the last episode. So I think, um, I can't think of the name of it. I, I uh, Carry Town, I think is the name. That's one that I showed you. It's textured and I'm wondering if it's going to be in there because uh, I, I might want that if I haven't gotten it already. So um, I'm wondering what you guys are working on. I finished my Junko sweater, which you saw. And I started on floozy. Let me show you where I'm at with the floozy. Um, I've, another thing I've been doing is I've been trying to help moderate in uh, the floozy knit along. I don't know how good of a job I'm doing. I um, <laughs> will be like out of pocket. I think a lot of the knitters are in Australia and New Zealand. And um, so our hours are a little different, but uh, like I'm, I'm like out of pocket most of the day and then all of a sudden in the evening I'm just like, you know, a barrage of posts. I'm probably obnoxious on that thread, but um, it's a really great forum. This is in Libby uh, of Truly Myrtle Designs. It's her um, podcast and design business um, Ravelry group. So I think it's called Truly Myrtle group. And uh, everybody's working on their floozy cardigan. So I've shown you what it looks like. I might put in a photo of the, what it's supposed to look like in the end, but you can see my progress. I kind of got almost finished with the color work and I had to stop and work on my um, test knit for Annie because I, I want her to get that out as soon as possible. I want to, you know, be a help and not a hindrance. So is this not lovely? I don't feel like you're getting the... It's just very dark. I, I did not get home today until dark, so I don't, um, I can't really. I guess that's good. You know, just because my vision is bad and I can't see it, doesn't mean you can't see it. <laughs> so I really love the yarn floozy kit that I'm using for this. Somebody commented, um, that they wouldn't have thought of using this light, light shell pink. Um, or maybe they were thinking of the bright, um, almost cranberry pink. But this, that looks almost like an off-white, it has a slight, just a, a slight pink to it that I just would never think 
of either of those pinks with this um, mustard color, but it really does work. It, they look really good together. Um, this is sort of a, a grayish pink. It's just very different. So um, the specks in the mustard are what you see as your bright pop of color, contrasting color. I think it's called wild berry. So foliage, wild berry, and I don't remember. Maybe I'll put it at the bottom of the screen. This is a great knit. This is a very silky, soft yarn. Um, I have only used, I don't think I've ever used wool silk blend for a garment before. I started with a sweater that I loved and it was feral and I did, I was doing so good. And then I just gained weight and I couldn't wear it. And I still have it somewhere like one of these days, I'm gonna lose all that weight. Um, that was nice yarn and it felt really soft. This is, has some cashmere in it too, so it's extra special. I think it's going to be kind of a finer garment for those fancy days, right? So that is a busy forum too, and I have wanted to take part in it quite a bit, so that's also kept me busy. The summer sweater knit along has ended. I finished nothing. I feel like such a loser, sorry. I feel like such a loser for not finishing. Uh, this is my first time ever to do a uh, knit along with Fairy Shannon that I finished nothing, but it's just, it's just been a busy time. Did I tell you I started back volunteering with BSF? So I'm working with three and four year olds and uh, <laughs> it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be a handful, but a lot of fun. Um, oh man. Uh, there were tears, you know, nervous ones. There were ones that were like, no, I want this chair. It's my chair. Um, they were saying funny things and uh, all of them want to have a good time. They liked playing with balloons. They liked singing. Uh, it's a really good program because it keeps things moving. So it can't get too, um, too boring for them. And if I do something and it kind of you know, bah -bah 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 flops, they, they're they going to be working with Play-Doh or having a snack in just a minute. So, you know, it's not the end of the world, but they were all pretty good. They were, uh, they helped us out quite a bit. So I'm just used to working with slightly younger ones. And since I haven't worked with young children in a while, since my kids were little, it's been nice to do that. It's felt really good to, I don't know, just deal with little ones. So that's part of my what am I going to do with myself now thing. I gotta drink something. Hang on. I'm totally dehydrated. You guys gave me some really good ideas. Um, but the truth is, I think we were all kind of on the same wavelength about, um, I kept saying, you know, I was joking. I want you to know, where is my stuff here? I want you to know that I would not decide what I'm going to do with my life based on comments from a podcast, okay? <laughs> but I really like all of your opinions and your thoughts. So I was joking, but I was very interested. Here it is. I was interested in what you would say. And um, uh, Jen had said, you know, just tackling all those photos that I need to um, scan would be a big job, a big undertaking. Plus, um, excuse me, uh, it's an emotional undertaking. It will be. Uh, I would think that if that's all I did this year, that I would have accomplished a lot. And even if future generations don't totally appreciate millions of photos of the past, uh, it will be there for them. So, I agree, Jen. That's got to become part of my weekly routine. It's just scanning a book, a full album of something or, you know, something like that. Louise said she also feels like um, I do about her children growing up. She really misses those days when everyone was together. And then one of her children lives in another country. And so getting to see them, it's maybe twice a year. And he has a son. So her grandson, she's just not getting to see as much as she would like. And so that's, that's got to be hard on your heart. But those visits I know are special. Um, 
And she also commented on us having uh, talked about, you know, social media friends and how real are those relationships. And she said she's actually met knitting friends that she made online um, when visiting her family in Berlin. She got to meet up with a podcaster she had met online, and they had chatted before, so they met in Berlin, and now they're truly real-life friends. That's uh, good. But that's how I feel about um, several people I know I'm going to meet, and then Katie and I going to Iceland. That was just a special trip because of all we had in common, and then we just did it. We just met one another and went, um, <clears throat> and it was a you know priceless time. It was a great memory. Um, She's also met, though, Louise has, people local to her via, you know, stuff online. And that was a surprise to her. She didn't know that there were many people that knitted in her community, and there really aren't. So that would be kind of like me. Uh, I've actually, um, a friend I knew, we used to go to church together. I haven't known her. I mean, haven't been around her in a while. I saw her posting online and I saw her posting knitting and I was like, wait, you know, and she's on Instagram too. And, and I was thinking the other day, we ought to get together and knit sometime and just go to a, get coffee and knit and talk because we don't see one another very often. And I thought, you know, we have something in common and there aren't many of us in Southeast Texas. So, uh, it's kind of cool though, that you use the internet and Instagram, Louise, to find someone right by you who does what you do. Um, so, uh, Adina was, kind of gave me some advice I felt like I needed to hear. She was saying, you know, she and her husband retired to Maine, and when they moved, she knew that she wanted to let things happen organically. She didn't want to get stressed out about, and what are we going to do, and when are we going to do this, and How's this going to work? And she just let things unfold naturally. You know, they just let their, their talents, their skills, their interests kind of lead them and things just happened as they should. And that was her advice to me. Um, she said, don't worry about plotting and planning. Just let your, your inclinations, your skills, your momentum guide you. Um, I appreciate that advice because um, there is a part of me that thinks, well, I should be working. I should definitely be making money for the future. It's only going to get more expensive to get old, <laughs> you know, but um, I don't feel up to it. And if I were to start working, I would have to quit volunteering where I do, which I love. And I might have to quit some of the things I'm doing that's kind of helping us get our health back on track, like uh, the amount of cooking well, not this week. This week I've been terrible. But normally the amount of things that I make uh, from scratch because we're avoiding certain foods that, you know, aren't good for us, they definitely aren't good for me. I wouldn't be able to do that as easily. So uh, I wouldn't be able to get out and walk and do things that, um, you know, they're really good for us as a, a couple. They're good for me as a person. So I didn't feel ready to get out and work immediately. I totally would if I had to. I mean, I, I would. I'm not afraid of hard work and everything I do, I do it kind of hard and crazy, but I, um, I just, it didn't feel right. And so when I read that comment <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago or whenever you, about a week ago, Adina, I thought I needed to see that. Um, because that's how I've been kind of handling it, but you almost, I don't know, we just live in a culture where it's about uh, amassing more things, a little more status. Um, it's really hard for some people to say, like me, to say, I, I didn't finish school. I mean, it's not really hard for me to say it, but uh, it is for some people, and it's uh, definitely a cause for some people to think less of you. I didn't finish college yet, I might, and um, I'm not immediately going to scramble to have some sort of career or status or income. Then there's also, like I said, the concern, well, I really need to be putting money away. That can happen. I'm not saying it won't. But uh, I did want to let things unfold naturally, a lot like Adina said. I appreciated that. Um, no, what did she say? Overthinking, plotting, or planning. 
that is exactly what I needed to hear. So, um, Katinka said, I need to learn to spin. <laughs> I think you're right, Katinka. I have one spindle. I got a kit off Craftsy on sale once. So I have a spindle and I have just a little bit of, um, like a tuft of wool to spend, to spin, not spend. Um, I would like to try that. That's not going to be first though. Um, you know, she said she has been, she's, you know, I talked in the last episode about how I know one thing I really loved. It was true with raising children and having a family and it's true now with other things I've been involved in is I love being part of a team and working together to do something good, a little meaningful. Um, I just love that feeling of teamwork and I don't get it a lot now that, you know, everyone's off doing their own thing. So, um, Katinka was saying that it's good to learn, you know, what fills our happy tank and that she's in the process of learning that too. But she already knows that she enjoys equipping people to reach their potential and she's trained as a counselor. So, I mean, that's a perfect fit for her. I could see how you would be good at that. Katinka. Um, Katinka is Aknatok, um, yeah, I'm saying it right, Aknatok Creations on uh, YouTube. But she's also a variant of that. I think it's Aknatok 1, uh, Katinka, and then Aknatok Creations on um, Instagram. She's got like two. But if you were to type in Katinka or Aknatok, and I'll have it at the bottom of the screen, and also in the description box, I'll talk about all the stuff I talk about here. Um, her daily posts are really thought provoking on Instagram. I really enjoy reading them. Even if I don't get to answer them, um, there's often a prompt there of something to think about, or she asks a question that's just, I find, um, enriching. And I could see how you would be excellent. I, just holding someone's hand a little as they reach their potential. Um, that's wonderful. She also likes working with animals. So, um, what, what do you train your animals to do? Um, what kind of like tricks or actual work? Um, you know, I don't know if it's just dogs and cats with you. Um, I, I was just interested Katinka and in what you train them to do. Um, cause you know, I'm doing this tomorrow. I start rally with Ella which is serving two purposes. I enjoy so much going to these uh, obedience classes. I love seeing how the trainer works with all these different dog personalities and works with their specific issues um, and gets them, you know, to, I don't know, self-correct, correct. correct. Uh, I enjoy that so much, but it also is going to help my dog with her um, extra energy and maybe she won't attack spot ever again. Um, we keep them separate quite a bit, but she needs that energy released. And also anything that reestablishes that I'm the boss of her is good. <laughs> so, um, Jen said, oh, I told you that, oh, she also said teaching knitting, volunteering and teaching other people to knit, especially younger people. That's a good idea. Um, Sarah Jane had mentioned volunteering, like just uh, make a list of things that I enjoy, like volunteering and um, different crafts, things I want to try, and then just go with what I feel like I want to do. Um, we're all kind of on the same uh, wavelength here. Uh, I have been volunteering um, at my church and with BSF, and I've continued to do that. And it's actually filled my... Um, last couple of weeks, all my free time between the things I told you about and preparing for this new season because we went paperless and different things are on different devices or websites. And it's just been kind of hard for me to remember where to gather all of my information. I feel like I'm completing, completely starting over with that study for the young kids, but, um, I'm excited about it. And I mean, it's already coming together. This week was much easier to plan for tomorrow than it was last week. So, uh, 
it's just uh, some interesting thoughts about, you know, what I want to do with my time and the volunteering is still there. Um, I haven't had time to be bored or too, you know, homesick for my kids uh, this last few weeks at all. It's just been too busy. And then uh, all the animals going to the vet was interesting. Something Sarah also said was that if we think too much about happiness, if we overthink it, we could find that we're very unhappy. Um, I would think that would frustrate us. Uh, I'm not in any danger of that. <laughs> I'm not saying that Sarah didn't think I was. She was just considering it. But um, yeah, there's no way I would be in danger of that. My first thought is never, do I like this? Does this make me happy? It's never my first thought. It probably should be more. My first thought is, is this the right thing to do? Is this good? Is, is this the best? You know, um, that is always almost my first thought. Not that I'm like always doing the right thing. And no, not at all. But uh, I have that sense of um, what are the right correct boundaries? You know, what I'm, I guess I'm looking for my place in the scheme of things. Am I doing the right thing or not? I don't think so much about am I doing the thing I want? Of course, it's good to consider both. And I should consider what's making me happy more. Um, I've spent a lot of time taking care of people since I was 21 <laughs> till this last few months, um, fairly intensely, especially at certain times. And I mean, it's not so bad to sit and think, you know, what, what does make me happy? Um, I'm not like, I wasn't worried about whether or not I was happy. I just had been getting so many recommendations from you guys to read The Happiness Project by Gretchen Rubin, who also has The Happier Podcast. So I did start it, and um, I'm just like a few chapters in. She's got these goals she sets to kind of um, address happiness in different areas of her life. And each month she kind of works on one area and then tries to keep it going throughout this year. So it's a year long project for her. Of course she had a book in mind and she's like somebody who obviously could overthink these things. Um, I wouldn't be that way. But, um, and I don't want to read a ton of it because, you know, we should all buy it if we want to read it. But, um, I liked some things she had to say about boosting energy. You know, you know that in the last few months we've talked about um, uh, health stuff, moving more. Um, I was walking while knitting. I didn't really do that a ton, but walking a lot. Uh, the Katie Bowman books and um, thinking about the food I eat, less sugar, less caffeine, all of that. Um, I've actually started feeling a return of some of my hormonal symptoms, and I think it was stress uh, because my diet has been really clean. It's been good, um, and I just don't eat a lot of sugar. The sore throat was coming back where I, I talked, like after doing this, I'm going to have no voice <laughs> for a while. My sleep has been extremely disrupted, and I don't understand why. But the more I get up at night, the more I encourage my cats to think this is normal, and then they're going to expect me to get up every few hours. So, um, you know, it kind of concerned me. So as I was reading in this book about um, exercising better and boosting her energy, she makes a comment about um, how regular exercise, we know this, you know, it, it actually even when you're tired, you kind of feel better and get things pumping and moving when you exercise. And Gretchen decided that she would act as though she had more energy than she really felt to try and give herself that. So sort of faking it till she makes it. And it worked for her. Like acting energetic helped her to feel energetic. And I can see when I do that, like, I'll, um, it's not like a put on, but when you have to do something for other people, you really give it your all. Whereas at home, you'd be just kind of, kind of a melted zombie. And then you feel better after you do it. I mean, why not just do that for my own sake? Um, put on a little, put on some music and clean the house kind of fast. Um, that gets you moving or um, go for a walk with the animals, something. So... I'm wanting to put that into practice. Another thing that she talks about in here, let me see, I wrote down the things that 
interested me. I'm going to be doing tons of cuts too. All truly great thoughts are conceived while walking. Um, that's, uh, it, it kind of does prove true. I, I think my best thoughts happen when I'm outside moving, doing something where my focus isn't on like the form of what I'm doing. I'm just enjoying it, like riding my bike or walking or running. Um, though I'm thinking I might need to stop running for a while if it's boosting this cortisol reaction in my body and I need to calm things down to help my hormones. I'm not quite sure. I feel great after I run. I feel like it's a great stress reliever for me, but if it's actually doing the opposite to my body, uh, I don't know. When I'm walking, I tend to make decisions about how I'm going to react to something, how I could handle something better in the future. A lot of my relational um, decisions are made through movement. So that's very true for me. Um, Uh, I, as I was walking in the last few weeks, I've been thinking about, there's some things on my mind that, um, I enjoy doing and I don't know what I want to do with it. I just want to start writing about it. It may just be a series of blog posts that nobody reads. Um, it, maybe it would be something more, but it gives me satisfaction to think it through and it might amuse or give inspiration to someone else. Um, so I kind of made a decision that that's something I want to be working on in my spare time also. So that's a creative pursuit. Um, and a lot of it has to do with uh, the low tech way I like to do things. So, you know, I've been talking about cleaning out my um, camera closet because I, I ordered a new camera. I needed to get some new lenses with it. I gave another camera to my daughter and uh, I thought I just need to go through all this old stuff I have. And let me just preface this with, I'm not showing you, oh, look at all the things I have. You need to understand that these are dirt cheap vintage cameras. A lot of them were 50 cents or a dollar. Um, this one was free. <laughs> I don't know if this one works. I've never actually tried the film for it. I think The Impossible Project started making less expensive film since I got this and I've been so busy. I mean, the last few years were not the time to try new things for me. So, um, I think The Impossible Project, I don't even think they're calling it Impossible Project anymore. It's not quite as much of a ricky-do as it was, so I might try um, using their film and have another one step. Um, oh, and another Spirit 600. Yeah, so see the look. Probably one of these is going to work. I'm going to give one to my daughter because she likes taking photos too. Um, yeah, I have two, <laughs> two of these uh, 600 um, ones, you know, land cameras. So anyway, I need to use those. So that's what I've decided to do with my free time. I'm scanning photos. I'm going to be writing down some thoughts on things um, having to do with um, all these cameras and all these photos and things I've collected and some of which I've never scanned. Uh, and I'm going to be using uh, my vintage cameras more. Um, you know, a while back, I think I showed you guys one of my Argus 75s. So this is a twin lens reflex camera from way back in the day. And I can't find my contraption I made for it, but the contraption is like a box. You basically, I took a Little Caesars pizza box and I folded it to go over the top of this, the lens, and then um, the viewfinder of it. And then my um, digital camera, ah, I don't have my digital camera here. My digital camera looks down into it. And so, you know, what you see when you look through, when I look down into this, I see what's in front, right? Because of the twin lens. So the contraption blocks out all the light and it 
allows you to take a photo of whatever you see through this camera with your digital camera. And then of course you can alter it any way you want. And so it's kind of tricky to make your box uh, work and super light tight and um, to get it also the right length. Like I liked to wear this around my neck and then be able to let it kind of hang there with the box. And then the other camera has to fit, you know. So there has to be room <laughs> for your face and uh, the box between. But um, I've taken so many fun pictures with these and you don't have to worry about film. That's, it's all digital. And there's a great, th it's called Through the Viewfinder or TTV Photos. There is a great, um, here's my other one. Same difference. These were like, uh, I think I paid $13 for both. Or maybe it was $30 for both, and they were each about $13, $15. That's beans. That's nothing. Um, they're often at antique stores and flea markets. So um, I'm going to show, I'm going to cut in <laughs> with some photos of things I've taken, you know, through the viewfinder. And my first digital camera was not a high-quality camera at all, but I had a lot of fun with it. I took a lot of photos that are super meaningful to me, and I just don't, especially after watching so much and reading so much where everything's about more tech and more tech and the most expensive and this look and the that look, and they're talking about all this editing and just editing a photo to death to make it look like everybody else's. Um, I don't like that at all. Um, some of my favorite photos were taken with my Polaroid 210. This takes Fujifilm pack film, which they make right now. Um, <clears throat> I got it off Etsy or eBay years and years ago, probably like 10 years ago. Um, it's so awesome. It takes some of the best photos. It's just really cool. So they've got that Polaroid look, but um, it's a slightly wider image. Uh, it's just really great, really great. This camera actually came with flash and all sorts of stuff, but I only use it outside. I never use the flash. This one is kind of a holy grail of uh, photo, uh, I mean vintage cameras. Um, this was kind of a big deal to me to have. And here's a pack of Color Shade PX70 I have still not used. That is horrible. I bet the film is not even good now. That's expensive, impossible project film. I should not have done that. Isn't it pretty? It's dusty. It's terrible. Mm, I really love it with this refinished like brown vinyl leather like uh, stuff. It's nice. Anyway, I've really not gotten to see how quality the photos from this camera are because all that was available at the time I got it was Impossible Project. So I took some, um, I took some photos with the fade to black um, set of photos and that's the ones that were faulty and they would, you would take the photo and then it would start fading. Um, but they were pretty interesting and I had a lot of them blown up and used for art around my house. Um, and then there was uh, something else. So this color shade was supposed to be the better of the types, the most predictable and reliable of uh, Impossible Project film for SX-70s. And I don't know, I might have used one pack. And then like, you know, you have several duds in each 10 photo pack. So I have a whole pack there I haven't used and that's really a shame. These things have just not been used in the last few years. Life got too busy for me. So anyway, I'm excited to use this one. And I really ought to just display this one. Um, another fun one, this is like a total no-fail camera, is the Fuji um, Instax, but the wide, the Instax uh, 210 wide. So basically, this is the same kind of photo as that Polaroid Land camera. As far as size, it's comparable, you know, it's comparable, but uh, the film 
Instax is really predictable and reliable. It's really good film. Um, I also have this little one, and I, I do have film for it right now. I got this around the time of my daughter's wedding because we did sort of a vintage memory type little theme. We didn't really worry about a theme, but um, yeah. So there's this one. Um, it's, it's the smaller uh, film cartridges. I think I have some in here. Nope. Um, I'm, I might have some photos I can show from this one. I think she mostly used it at her wedding reception, and then I was going to take photos with it, and that was a hard time. <laughs> there was no time for taking fun photos with uh, disposable or instant cameras. But, um, so, you know, this is here, and I have pack film for it. It's crazy. Um, as I looked through all of these, I saw my Minolta, which is my first real camera camera. Like, I had a Kodak disc camera when I was a kid, and I took really crappy pictures with it. But this uh, camera was my first uh, 35 millimeter, and um, it just took some really good sharp images. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know that it's anything special, but it's special to me. I took um, these photos. Of course, I blew them up and, you know, used a regular printer, <laughs> crappy computer printer to print them out. But these little photos of my children, they're some of my favorites. I, I usually had black and white film for that camera. Um, I don't know why. I just always, maybe it was cheaper and I always bought that. Um, and maybe I'll show some photos that I took with it. They were all really good. It was really no fail with this camera. And it was good for me learning how to use a manual camera. Um, let's see, what else do I have here? Here's one I haven't really used. I took one roll of film, and it's really hard to uh, get the focus and stuff right. Um, the deciding your distance and your um, shutter speed, aperture, all that on this Fed. Uh, I don't remember even what all the difficulties were with it. It's uh, manual, but it doesn't have any kind of metering inside of it. You, you're, you're doing all of it based on what you know of the camera. So um, it's like a, a Russian camera that's just a vintage. They're kind of popular uh, online feds. Uh, there's like Flickr groups devoted to them. Um, it, when like one photo came out in focus uh, in the one roll of film I used, it was good. And the colors were really good. It was neat. It did have a different look than say the Minolta. I, never really even got to indulge in this. I went through the spell where I haunted uh, eBay looking for vintage stuff for cheap. <laughs> vintage photos and cameras. I mean, not photos, vintage cameras. And so uh, I sometimes I would get like a pack, like I got two for $30. Um, this one, uh, this Yashica came with another one that was a little bit in rougher shape. Um, that I haven't even uh, cleaned up or worked on at all. And I need a lens cap for this. This takes beautiful, soft, subtle um, color photos. I mean, it could take black and white too, but I've only used it for color. And I took some photos I just love of California with this camera. Uh, it was just special. All of those are special. And it's, you know, a 35 millimeter, film camera, but there's some light metering. It makes it a little easier for you to know um, where to set your aperture, things like that. <clears throat> so anyway, I've just got a bunch of stuff to busy myself with. Um, oh, looky here. Here's a real Diana camera, the toy plastic camera. You know how like Holgas were a big deal and um, well, Instagram started as mimicking uh, Polaroids and instant cameras, and then there was, uh, what was the one before Instagram? It was such a big deal. Um, it wasn't the Holga. 
No, I don't even remember what it's called. And it was the one everybody was a member of before. Or it was the app people used before Instagram. And Instagram was kind of fun for the photo it made. It wasn't so much fun for the photo sharing and community, at least to me at first. Um, anyway, this is a... I'm going to see what that app was. Hipstamatic. Yeah, yeah. Hipstamatic. Um, it had that Holga look. And Holga's and Diana's are like the same kind of idea. Lots of light leaks and imperfect photos that are perfectly imperfect. So um, this is kind of what I've been thinking about and enjoying lately, looking back at it. So I'll put in a few photos I took with this. You need to understand how easy it is to leave the lens cap on your Diana. And that is exactly what I did. Uh, because you aren't looking through, you know, the lens. You are looking straight through this. So you're actually seeing a little above what will be framed in your photo. And so I took this to Peru and I was in a little village called Wankane and the sun was setting and the streets were hilly and I'm going, I'm looking up the street and it's all those beautiful colors of um, homes in South America. Like, you know, even if to, I don't know, to the people who live in that city, if it looks beautiful, but it's all these um, subtle shades of blues and pinks and browns and reds. And uh, they're all kind of faded looking and the sun was setting and it was beautiful. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is the best. And, you know, if you move at all and the light is low, you shake and you get a blurred image. But there's like a hack where um, down here in your little screw thing for a tripod, I screwed in a, uh, a little tripod connector and then a string. And I would step on the string. It was like a shoelace and I would hold, pull up on this. So it would give it some tension and keep it steady. And I took my photos, I was so proud. And as I walked away, I realized I had my lens cap on. So I raced back and I tried to do it, but it was too dark and none of them were very good. Poor me. <laughs> do you hear violins? Um, yeah. This is what I used. I think I even have the string in here, maybe. So I also have a Diana back, though, for a regular 35 millimeter camera. So it can give you that look. Um, anyway. These, this is, these, these cameras didn't collect all at once. This is like 20 years of collecting cameras here and there. And not using a lot of them very much at all. This is something fun um, for your digital camera. If you have like a Canon Rebel type camera, there's some that work with a Rebel. This can work with a Rebel. It's the, um, oh, I don't have it in here. Lens Baby lenses. Um, this just has different optics for each one. And that gives you a tilt shift. I love tilt shift photos. I'm not sick of them yet, even though, you know, they were all over Instagram and everywhere. Um, Lens Baby is really neat, I think, when there's like water in the background or um, sky, you know, some kind of plain, more solid background. I love the way it, it twists people in portraits. So, what else is there? I think that's it. That's all the stuff that I needed to look through and sort and I've pulled it all out to show you. <laughs> um, you know, I've got one more project I started. I don't know if I showed you in the last one. I'm doing um, the uh, Ramblin' Rhinebeck Cow with Caitlin Hunter and the Farmer's Daughter Fibers. I would love a Farmer's Daughter Fiber sweat, uh, sweater, the yarn from it, but I have Sunset Highway on the needles. I've got Pluzy, I've got um, uh, sea glass and driftwood, and I wanted to do something I could work on right away and be part of that um, knit along. So I am doing uh, the Cardamom Coffee Hat by Caitlin Hunter, and I think these are really, really pretty colors together don't really know that this is showing very well. Yes, that this right here, 
um, Monarch is the name. It's my favorite. And it's only in there just a tiny bit. So these are my colors. And this is my favorite. <coughs> but I'm going to have a lot of it left and I'm thinking it could do something else color work. So my dilemma when thinking about this hat was the sample called for Madeline Tosh, Tosh Merino Light. You know, that's a single. It's not tightly spun or anything. So um, I thought this uh, Sukapi um, yarn is also a single. Uh, it's really rustic and it's got a nubby look to it. It's really special. I thought it, it's Rambouillet, it probably, it will be fine for me, but I can wear anything uh, on my head and not itch, but I just was concerned a little, and I, um, I said something on the, uh, on Instagram, and, um, anyway, I was assured, yes, yes, it'll be perfect, it'll be wonderful, and so, uh, I'm so happy I did it. It feels very soft very soft to me. It doesn't have a scratchy feel at all, as far as I'm concerned. I am going to love wearing this. And you know what? It's not even coming up to, there's a little bit of puckery here, but not so much up here. I think it's going to fit too. So that's a really fun one to work on. That's something else I've got going. I've been busy knitting, guys. <laughs> and then last but not least, oh, it's the sock from Iceland that I still haven't finished and I don't have it with me and I'm barricaded in my stuff so I'm not going to get it. I wanted to say that um, with that book I'm reading The Happiness Project, she had some thoughts. I'm on to relationships and that's what I'm interested in. What her thoughts on um, boosting happiness in relationships will be like and you know, I said that my son has moved away. It's just me and my husband here. We're having a lot more quality time than we did. And there's also an opportunity for more tension or troubles. So, you know, things that maybe you kind of set aside because you just got the busyness of family and children and grandparents and stuff to deal with. All of a sudden, it's front and center again. And so I was kind of interested in what she would say. Um, she made a comment about how marriages are like the most important um, relationship in our lives. It's like the one, the foundation on which the rest of our relationships are built. I guess I can see that. Um, but she said it's also the one that we are most likely to behave badly in. And that's true. Um, I think that if anyone's seen my ugly side, it's definitely my husband. I'm not, and I know I've seen his, you know. Um, I'm not interested in um, trying to fix his side of anything. I'm, I really want to do everything I can to boost my happiness and my relationships myself, always, you know. It's kind of like we said before, you can't control other people, but from my side of things, I can at least do whatever. So I was interested in what her thoughts were, and she had this one, um, she called it her one of her 12 commandments, the 12th one, was there is only love. So she had this friend who did this. Um, she never said anything negative about someone. Someone that she had been warned, this person is going to be difficult to work with. You are going to hate it. You need to be prepared for this. And so the friend just went into it saying, I will think nothing negative. I will say nothing negative. It's not even an option. And so... Gretchen tries this in her marriage. I'm interested. I haven't even read on to see how that worked out for her. But I've done that before. I've said, ooh, I'm just going to take a week or two and try to say nothing complaining. Um, and no sneaky complaints either. You know how, like, there's, oh, I thought you said you were going to do such and such, you know, and then you didn't finish. A uh, sneaky complaint would be, and how did that such and such go? When they know, you know, they didn't do it. I don't. I don't want to do that kind of thing. Um, in the end, her friend found that she actually liked the person who probably was overbearing and difficult. 
and I'm not saying bad things about my husband. I'm not comparing him to this person, but this was someone that everyone had a problem with. And because her friend chose not to allow herself to even go there, she actually liked the person. Um, I'm just wondering if that's possible to, uh, for me to so disconnect, like the ability to think I, I always evaluate things. Um, I'm not saying I evaluate people good, bad, you know, and judge them, but you know, if someone's being smart aleck to me, I, I recognize they're being smart aleck. I can't not see it. Um, and I'm verbal. I'm super verbal. So I'm probably going to say, why are you being smart aleck? Um, so to not do that will be really hard for me. Um, I've done it before. So I thought, well, I'm going to do that again. You know, we don't want to kill each other uh, now that our son's moved out. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Uh, another thing was to not ask or remind her husband to do tasks. She started doing this where she would just, uh, let me see how she said it. This sounds kind of um, annoying <laughs> to me. Like, uh, remember you promised to figure out what was wrong with our video camera? So we can go to the park? Instead, she would just say, camera. And her husband would be like, huh, and go do it. Kind of like, where's the ball? And the dog goes, huh, and does it, you know? I think I would know that someone was changing their tact with me. I think I wouldn't like that. Uh, so I don't think I'll do that. But the idea of finding a different way to say something. So for me, I don't think my husband gets mad if I ask him to do something. I do think he'll get miffed if I ask him and I make it clear that, you know, you already said you were going to do this, right? Okay. You know, that was a month ago, right? You know, that would annoy him. So I could just ask again if it was something I couldn't do myself. But for the most part, I'm really trying to just, if I want it, or I want to do it, just do it myself. Some things I can't do though. Um, so no expectations is a big one for me. And I just remind myself of that every once in a while. Um, she also talks about when you do something for someone for credit. You know, maybe it's not officially for credit, but you really like it when they uh, notice it and give you a gold star. And she said, I had to start telling myself, I'm doing this for me, not for anyone else. Otherwise, if you don't get that notice or that credit, you, you might feel a little bitter. I don't really think I do that. I don't know. Maybe I need to have him here and ask him. Um, hmm. Maybe I do need to have him here and ask him a lot of these things and see what he says. Ooh, you guys are going to watch us fight. <laughs> I'm totally going to do that. It'll be a special episode. It'll be like my so-called handmade life and then you'll see it crack like a heart like a heartbreaking <laughs> no <laughs> okay um so yeah now i'm reading about how she says to fight right you know i've read marriage books like this isn't a marriage book uh and i didn't get this for marital advice but as i saw oh yeah she's gonna work on her relationships um, i was interested in what she would say because it's not a marriage book I've read marriage books before. I've read Christian marriage books. I've read, you know, just regular self-helpy type things. And um, uh, so I don't know that any of this will be earth shattering. But uh, anyway, that's my husband. He knew we were talking about him. He's so annoying. He's saying, if you'll put together a grocery list, I'll go by the store on my way home. <sighs> oh. I better shut up and be thankful, huh? Because um, I couldn't do the store today. I had so much to do. Anyways, so I don't know what to ask you guys. Um, what's something you would like to see or hear more of on this podcast? Because I, I took so long away from talking. I felt like... Um, there was, there also weren't a lot of comments to guide where this goes next. And I kind of like when you guys mention something, I take it and kind of go with it. I, doing this is interesting enough. I think just this focus on relationships, like not nagging and being positive only, um, saying nothing negative 
Now, I mean, like if somebody is abusing you or something, you don't have to say that's okay and ignore that, obviously. But um, just for regular people, uh, it couldn't hurt, you know, to just try. And like the example in the book was a work relationship between a boss and an employee. It wasn't even a marriage relationship. It could work with siblings or mother and child or something. Um, have you guys ever done that? Have you ever uh, just said, I am not going to say one negative thing to this person for X amount of days or maybe ever? And how did that work for you? Or if you've never done it, are you willing to do it? Could you give it a week and just say, I'm going to give it a month because that's what she did in this book and I'm interested to see what happens. And then I'm, I'm still, I mean, these chapters are super short. I mean, tonight I will find out what, uh, if it worked for her, um, possibly tonight, unless it's at the end of the book that she talks more about it. But, um, I've heard lots of people recommend it and I've done that before. I don't really remember that anything great or different, you know, came about because of it. But it does help me stop and see myself. Boy, you sure sound like a witch, you know. Um, and you have to be more creative when you can't just complain because you're frustrated. So it also gets me to just take my issues straight to God. Just bypass the whole argue with your husband thing and just go straight to the one who's probably going to fix it anyway or fix me. So anyway... That's, yeah, that's what I want to ask you guys. Have you ever tried the experiment of saying nothing negative to someone for a certain amount of time? And how did it affect the relationship? And if not, is there someone you could try that with this week? And let me know how it works for you. Please, I'm really interested. Um, also, you guys tell me if there's something you would kind of like to see on this podcast. I'm not going to be so harem scarum next time. I'm getting back on a regular schedule. Uh, my schedule for the rest of this next nine months is set. So I know what days I'm going to do this. And it should be a whole lot easier now that I have new tech. Hopefully it won't be uh, the mess it was. And I missed you. I missed you a lot. So happy knitting and, uh, I don't ever know how to end these. I feel like, I don't know. I used to call my grandmother and I know she needed to get off the phone, but she would just hang on the phone a little bit longer and say one more thing. Okay, well, all right now, bye bye. Oh, oh, but what about, and I realized one day that she felt kind of rude just letting it go. It was hard for her to get off the phone just in case. She didn't want to be the one to hang up. So, uh, I thought that was sweet, you know, and between the two of us, we just, oh, well, uh, uh, oh, oh, and just say one more thing constantly to one another, but that was maybe kind of a southern lady way of being polite, and, uh, and that was sweet, and she would go, oh, bye, she would say, oh, bye, like that, oh, and I miss hearing that, well, oh, bye. <laughs> <laughs>